Okay, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started, and uh, we take care of some housekeeping things while some, some others continue to join us on tonight's webinar. Uh, I do want to appreciate or thank all of you for uh, uh, joining us tonight, taking time out of your schedules to talk pigs for a little while longer, and I uh, do want to thank you all for those of you that, that joined Ryan last month to, do, to discuss some baiting tips and techniques. Uh, while we're getting everybody started off tonight, while we're still loading them up is we want to make sure that you're if you're new to the to the feature tonight to the zoom meeting uh, we want to make sure that you're aware of the chat and the q a uh, components of the meeting so if you want to look at your toolbar on there you see that that icon there that says chat uh, what's what we'll do tonight as we go through we'll ask you to log your questions into that chat box and uh, a couple of my compadres tonight on the meeting with us is ryan and marshall and uh, we get started here in just a minute. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, Ryan and Marshall, but what we wanna make sure that you do is put those questions that you may have in that chat feature. And then uh, as we go through there, we'll be continuing to monitor that, that, uh, that box and then address your, your questions as, you, as we get toward the end of the, the, uh, the program. So uh, with that, what I want you to do, just to make sure that you know uh, how to use that chat feature and so forth, I would like for you to open that chat feature and then tell us what your primary non-target species that you have the most trouble with around your pig rig trap system. So the next few seconds there, put that, that, uh, that, that species of concern that you're most focused on, uh, that helps us astronomically to know how to better support you as we move forward and, uh, and making sure that we can get you the timely information that you need. And I see the balloon starting to pop up pretty quickly in that chat, so we do appreciate it. Uh, while you're still logging in tonight on the on the chat feature, as well as people continuing to to join us, uh, like I said earlier, a couple of my compadres that are on tonight is, is Ryan. Ryan is that is is one of our trap support uh, guys that you talk to whenever you call in and and visit with us. And Ryan is a uh, uh, one of our subject matter experts that that he has got a just a wealth of information and knowledge to be able to help you pretty much in any situation you're facing. Uh, and Marshall is our trap support manager. Uh, so Marshall is the one driving the bus whenever you have concerns with uh, with trap support, whether that be installations or an absolute critter that just giving you the blues. Whenever you call in and talk to trap support, you're gonna get you're gonna talk to Marshall and uh, and he'll uh, he'll navigate you through what you need to to know about. Uh, that particular species, or maybe some tips and tricks that you may want to throw at those guys to uh, to basically knock them off the rocker and uh, and be able to continue to catch pigs without nearly as much trouble or influence from things that we don't want trouble or influence from. So tonight, what we're going to do, we're going to start off, and I see a ton of those those chats that are still coming in, those comments that are still coming in. I still see uh, participants continuing to join us and. And uh, definitely as you come on, let us know in that chat feature what your primary target, non-target species of concern is uh, that gives you fits at your pig, pig rig trap site. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna move into uh, to the to a couple of things that we have coming up as we get everybody on board. Uh, some things to think for think about moving forward is uh, is some of those those classes that are on the screen in November. Uh, obviously, what we're going to do that night is talk about carcass disposal and current legal options, and that's one of those things we want to make sure that you're out trapping pigs and enjoying it while you're doing it. But we want to make sure that you're legal and and how you go about that that effort, and as well as whenever you have those those pigs captured and those carcasses there to take care of. What are your options? What can you do with those? And, uh, and some thoughts that we have there as far as time of year and, and what else may be going on your, on your land that, that, that those carcasses may actually help you. So if you wanna find out how a, a pig carcass could help you, think about next no, or November, next month. Uh, the thing that I wanna make sure that you're aware of next month is that we typically have this event on the fourth Thursday night of each month. With Thanksgiving coming up next month, we know that fourth Thursday night will actually be Thanksgiving Day. So what we're going to do is we're going to back that up one month or one week rather, and we're going to have that event next month uh, on the third Thursday night of November. And I think if I'm right, Brooke, would you maybe able to put that in that checkbox? But that's going to be on November the 17th uh, when we have that next uh, the, the the carcass and disposal current legal methods and options uh, discussion. Then in November, we're also going to retract that date from the fourth. Uh, Thursday to the actually the second Thursday in December so we make sure that you have plenty of time to spend with friends and family as we approach the Christmas season so uh, with that 
that and there's other pro, uh, programs that we have coming up for you what we want you to do if you see something that's not on that list as we move forward definitely reach out to us and we make sure that we can put those uh, those presentations those topics in the queue that we address what your concerns are uh, in the coming months with with that what we're going to do tonight we're going to not uh, stand on the soapbox much longer before we get into the nuts and bolts of this this program and and obviously what we want to talk about is in 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 I guess succession to what Ryan talked about last week or last month and baiting pigs and, and baits and tips and trick, tricks of, of baiting pigs. Tonight, we're going to kind of flip the script a little bit and we're going to think about how do we want to continue moving forward with catching pigs, but trying to avoid those non target species. So, with that, we want to make sure that we catch the whole sounder and just the sounder. So, uh, leave those other critters out of the, out of the concept. So, First thing that we need to do whenever we get any any trapping effort underway, we need to kind of understand what the problem may be, what what our our situation we may be facing is, and how big that situation is. So for us, what we want to do, what we want to see you think about doing as well in your situation is put those cameras in the field, put those to work for you pretty quickly. Because the first thing we need to know is what non-target species could you have in your area that's going to give you those fits as you're moving forward. And, and what we need to think about there is not just the species, but how many are there. So if you've only got one or two raccoons in the area, one or two raccoons might not be giving you a fit. But if you're out there and you're trying to bait and the, and the pigs can't get to the trap because of the line of coons trying to get to your trap, then and uh, you may may have to need to talk through. Uh, the other thing is we need to understand those non-target species patterns. And and the fall of the year, obviously, Mother Nature is changing her clothes a little bit this time of the year. So we start seeing animals moving different patterns as, as from what they did in the summer and the spring. Also, we see huge, huge flocks of. For, for me down in the south, we see a huge flocks of migratory blackbirds that are moving through that just absolutely love the taste of, of, uh, of corn. So we need to think about are those, those patterns of non-target species, are they during the daytime, are they at nighttime, or do we have to just worry about them uh, every time that clock, you know, that, that second hand strikes on that clock? The other thing we need to think about is, is it livestock or is it wildlife that we're going to have concerns with? Obviously, we can't tell wildlife how we want them to behave, but some of those things that, that circle around the livestock concerns, we can address some of those issues uh, with regard to pig trapping. And then when we think about human activity, we want to think about that in a couple of different ways you need to make sure that if you're the land manager on there and you've got some i don't know if you're if your kids are like mine and sometimes they don't listen too well you want to find out before they they hit the, the hit the, the the dirt roads if they're out there shooting coons or they're out there popping caps at cans or whatever else and you're trying to catch pigs that's not a good combination so what we want to think about in there as well as human activity is what does your time schedule look like you know, I tell people in all these in, in programs wherever I go is that the best thing that you can find on your own property is your shadow. Because if you can find your own shadow on your property, it's obviously that you're in tune with the land and what the land is, what's going on on that land. But we, we do have hectic schedules. And sometimes if your human activity doesn't allow you to be on that landscape, we need to put those cameras to work for us. We need to use those cameras for that reconnaissance to give us the data back where we can make educated decisions about how we move forward with our trapping and predominantly or specifically with regard to this presentation, what do we need to do to avoid the non-target species based on that information that we gather through those camera uh, images and reconnaissance. So next thing we need to think about, you know, what we, whenever we see there on their game animals and fur bears, when we think about game animals, we do not want you to get a love note from the game and fish department because you just didn't understand what was going on with regard to a game animal. So what we mean by that is that if you're out there trapping around uh, game animals, may, may that be white-tailed deer or turkeys or anything like that, you may want to check with your local game warden and, and your game laws in your state to find out is it even legal to harass those animals? If they're in, in a lot of states out there, you can't even harass those animals if they're in an area that may be occupied by pigs as well. So think about what those game laws are and it never hurts to let your game wardens know what's going on on your particular piece of property because they're an extra set of eyes that can help out. Other things that are out there with regard to fur bears that could predominantly be at the trap site, your raccoons. Not so much we're worrying about bobcats and things of that nature, but your raccoons at your trap sites, if your state considers those a fur bearer animal, then you may have to have additional permitting if those animals are in those traps. 
the main thing about this with fur bears with regard to raccoons is if you get to your trap and your your pig rig trap system has a, a whole parcel of raccoons in it whenever you get to that trap then you got to think about what are my legal options with regard to fur bears does those legal options allow you to dispatch those raccoons in that trap and what i mean by that or the reason for that is that in many states they have a depredation allowance that says if those fur bears are even in the depredation process you have the opportunity to uh, dispatch those animals the question that you need to clear up with your game and fish department is are those animals in the act of depredation if they're at your your pig rig site so you need to get those gray areas ironed out before you go out there and find a trap full of raccoons that you really don't know what to do with uh, the other thing that's in there too that we need to think about planning your approach with regard to the time of the year and when we think about the time of the year the first thing that comes to me or comes to my mind is if you have livestock on the property do you rotate those livestock? And if you rotate those livestock, then you want to think about how your rotation is going to look throughout the remainder of the year and where do you put your pig brig in, rel in, in relation to the, the rotation of those cattle uh, throughout the year. The other things you may want to think about are birthing seasons. And we'll talk a little bit more specifically, well, much, uh, much more specifically rather, with regard to those birthing seasons in next month's uh, discussion when we talk about carcass disposal and things like that. But this is one of those places, if you think about the time of the year and birthing seasons, where could those animal carcasses benefit you to take the attention of those birth young that's on the landscape, take the attention of those predators off of those young and put it on a, on a, on a carcass that's out there. So think about those kinds of things as you start planning your approach. The other thing you want to think about with non-target species is what is the primary food source of that non-target species and when is it most plentiful? And if it's something that doesn't line up with the preferences of pigs throughout the year, then whenever it doesn't line up with the preference of pigs, that may be whenever you want to drop those nets and make those pig rigs work for you whenever that non-target species is focused on something else out there other than the bait that's in your pig rig. Uh, regional differences do exist. So whenever we see something at Marshall's trapping pigs over in Georgia and everything is rocking and rolling and, and things are happening from him or for him and I'm here in Texas and uh, whatever I do, the most beneficial thing I can do in trying to trap pigs is beat on the wall because I can't figure things out. What's working for Marshall may not work for me. So, and those regional differences do exist. So you need to think about what's happening in your specific region with regard to non-target species or the natural food availability with what's out there for pigs, which comes to the next point that's very, very difficult and sometimes. Pigs are smart. Pigs do not listen to instruction. We cannot rehabilitate a pig by talking sense into them, okay? So whenever we start thinking about those pigs, don't overreact if you start seeing pigs not cooperate the way you think they should. So typically what happens, and this is something that, that we need to think about with regard to baiting and things of that nature, is whenever we start looking at those, those things not falling in line with what we think that they should, we need to ask the question why before we start throwing the kitchen sink at them and, and trying to hope that, that, that we can do this like a shade tree mechanic on a car engine not knowing what's wrong and just throw parts at it until we fix the problem. So what we want to do is kind of is step back before you overreact and, and evaluate the whole process and why is the, the situation presenting itself the way that it is. The next thing comes up far more often, okay, as the, 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 those of us on the pig brig team convened a few minutes before we started this presentation tonight, we were discussing the, the escalating occurrence and, and calls that we have coming in focused on bears. So whenever we have thinking about the, the process with bears and whenever old Yogi decides to show up with your picnic basket inside the, the pig rig, if you know that you have bears in the area and you wanna to try to, pro, uh, to, to condition those pigs for two weeks or so, just because your calendar doesn't allow you to set that trap for two weeks, you may not need to condition those pigs for two weeks just because the calendar doesn't line up. It's still taking into account when you when you know you're going to have time to condition those pigs or, or to to catch those pigs, and then you back your your window of conditioning up a little bit. So instead of overrunning the conditioning process further than what it may need to go, giving those bears extra time to show up, you may want to be more concise or more precise in the length of conditioning with regard to trying to get those pigs off the landscape. 
before that bear shows up. But once they once they find that bait site and they know that it's a sustainable bait site where they can get a, a belly full of corn or whatever you're using for bait, they typically don't go back or, or don't go away. I will tell you before we move on from this situation here, we'll bring it up probably again a little bit later. Pig Brig does have several research projects in the field right now looking at bear deterrence. So we want you to stay in contact with us as we move through the fall and the, and the winter. And whenever that data becomes available, we'll def definitely get that out to you so we can make sure that we, we have you up to date on everything that we know. We want you to, to know as well. So as we're going through that process, what we want to think about too is obviously you're the boss, okay? Nothing happens unless you're the one that deems that necessary to happen. So when we think about that, we need to go back to our cameras and start analyzing what did the cameras show us, all right? Are the, are the non-target species herbivores or omnivores? Or we could even throw in the carnivore in there as well. Because when we start seeing what those cameras tell us in those non-target species, uh, we need to think about what do we possibly need to bait with to avoid some of the dietary uh, preferences of those species that are out there. And it could be just that simple that we don't get to use the old standard tried and true bait that we've become accustomed to using because that non-target species may highly select for it as well. So certain times of the year, we may need to shift gears or adjust those, uh, those, those, those decisions to avoid certain species at certain times of the year. And then also to... When do the pigs visit the trap? And this is something that I think is goes back to our human behavior. And sometimes the data, the information is right there at our fingertips, but it slips past us pretty easily because if you've got pigs and, 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 and they're not visiting the trap until eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night, then we might not need to bait those traps at seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. And baiting those traps, and we know we're not gonna have pig visitation to that trap for the next 12, 14, 15 hours, is allowing all of those non-target species unabated access to your pig brig trap site and your bait before the pigs ever even show up. And if you're and if you're in an area like what I see every winter is if you bait at the wrong time of the day and you get one of those black sky flocks of blackbirds flying in on you, they can literally remove 15, 20 pounds of corn within 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, so we want to think about the time of the day. When do the pigs visit the trap in relation to when when do we need to bait that trap to shorten that window between non-target or, or between your baiting and pigs showing up to lessen the possibility of non-targets at the trap site? Uh, then what we need to do, then you set the pattern of pigs. Well, pretty much everything, but pigs set their pattern based on your behavior. So you still, you're the boss, you're the one that dictates the, the progression of what goes on at that trap site. So the main thing that we need to think about in here is those three things that, that, that are listed there. Number one for me is to be consistent, all right? We already talked about in the previous slide to be patient, so forth and so on. But for me, with that, that consistency and patience goes hand in hand. So if you're, if you're consistent at baiting that trap at an hour before dark, stay consistent in baiting that. And for those of you out there that have livestock, that have cattle, in the wintertime, if you go out there and cube those cattle and you condition those cattle to that cube truck, whenever it's about that time of the day, every day, where are the cattle's typically standing? As close to the gate as they can where the cube truck comes through the gate, okay? Pigs are no different. Whenever pigs start getting accustomed to hearing that, that vehicle engine, whether that be your truck or your side-by-side -side or your four-wheeler or whatever, they're gonna start acclimating uh, that, that vehicle sound or that behavior to food on the ground and the dinner being set. So we need, need to be consistent, stay consistent with that time of day. And whenever we start thinking about the consistency with that time of day, whenever I go to a trap site to condition pigs, uh, I make sure that I definitely drive right up to the side of the trap, okay? I'm going to make sure that those, those pigs know where they hear that engine come to a, come to a standstill. I'm going to keep the engine running. I'm going to keep the radio playing. I'm going to keep talking to whoever I'm there uh, with, showing them that my pig rig site. And as those pigs get acclimated to hearing those noises, when that engine starts to fade off in the distance, they'll hear that and they'll understand that and be acclimated to the fact that means there's food on the ground and it's ready to go. So some of us though, we need to keep this in mind because it very often happens that as those pigs become more acclimated to your behavior, you can literally put your eyes on those pigs coming to the trap site while you're still there. And man, I know it's tough to not reach for that rifle and start trying to take care of business right there. 
but that's the worst thing you can do. If you start seeing pigs at the trap site while you're trying to condition those pigs, that just means you're doing a phenomenal job. And whenever you actually drop that net and then catch those pigs, you need to be ready for a net full the next morning. So that, that, you, that just means that you're doing a good job. So the other thing about this with keeping the engine running and being consistent in your behaviors, if you're one that likes to take old Fido with you whenever you go out to the trap site, whether it's on your side by side or in your truck or, or whatnot, make sure you don't let old Fido out of that trap or that vehicle at your trap site because yeah, they may get used to hearing that dog bark and it doesn't really bother them too much and all. But typically whenever the old boy hits the ground and starts making a lap around your pig rig, he's gonna probably mark a few trees around there and he's gonna end up marking your trap and so forth and so on. Well, a little bit of dog urine right there in that area may go a long way and keep those pigs bumped back. So keep, keep old Fido and Rover in the truck whenever you're, you're baiting, but take them with you if you want to. Uh, the other things that we need to do there is we need to minimize non-target uh, management during the conditioning and the catch period. What that means is just like what we talked about previously, Keep your finger off the trigger, all right? So if you're out there and you're trying to catch pigs, you're like, well, I didn't shoot at the pig. It was a coon there that I needed to get rid of. The pig don't know that that's who you were shooting at, all right? It could be that you're out there and it's just so happened that you, some of us in the South and it's getting close to Christmas time and holidays, we want to shoot some mistletoe out of the top of the trees. And uh, those, those pigs don't know that. They just hear gunfire. They hear something they don't like. And, uh, and non-target management, specifically hands-on management with gunfire and a lot of human activity does not bode well for, for uh, conditioning or catching pigs anywhere close to that trap site. So for me, I'm not, just, I'm not even going to take the gun with me whenever I go to condition those traps. I'm just going to completely remove all chances that I'm going to pull the trigger. Okay, so we're going to move through here and other thoughts that we have about non-target species. How much do we feed? Okay, whenever I start going in there and conditioning a trap, I'm not going to show up with a corn trailer full of bait to just start bait and knocking that, knocking that, or, or filling that area up. What I want to do is gradually increase it whenever I'm going through that, that conditioning phase, phase just to make sure that what's getting put on the ground is getting picked up by pigs. So we show up out there at seven o'clock in the morning and condition our trap, knowing that those, those pigs aren't gonna be there until 9.30 or 10 o'clock tonight. If you only put five pounds on the ground, probably before dark, the deer have already gotten it picked up. Okay, so you may wanna alter your behavior. And if you don't alter your behavior, you need to allow for that longer exposure that deer have to that trap site before you uh, uh, and, 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 and account for that and how much bait that you use. So the other thing that we think about there, do we even use feed, okay? And what I mean by that, if your standard go-to is the old yellow dent corn, then do we even use, do we even use feed? Do we use something else that could be possible that, that those pigs would be readily attracted to, which could be a pheromone of, of some kind? And, and later in the progressions, we'll talk about pheromones and things like that in the, in the coming months. Or it could be as simple as those pigs and some of those earlier pigs that you caught uh, weeks earlier, they may be covered in external parasites, ticks and fleas and things like that. We might not need to use feed. We may just need to take some old French fry grease or, or catfish grease or something like that from the previous fish fry and pour it on the rug and lay in that trap. And those, those animals are looking for that, that, that fry grease or something to, to, to use as an insect repellent. It's the same concept that what we see whenever you're looking at light poles along the highway and you see those mud rings around the light poles on the highway. They're looking for the creosote off those light poles to use as an external insect repellent. So if you see those pigs that are, that, are, that are coming through that may have some external parasites, that could be something to attract them. But also, too, we're not going to see deer rubbing on a light pole. We're not going to see a coon out there rolling around in French fry grease. So we want to make sure that we think about what's out there, what are other possibilities. With that, we want to move into the next one there that we do not want to ever, ever, ever. You're, you're not going to catch us recommending the use of diesel in your, in your bait. Okay, so the reason for that, there's several things, and I know we've hit it on several previous webinars, but the bottom line is, is diesel is a soil contaminant that can end up in your water supply. We don't want to use anything that could be ex any kind of contaminations or anything like that that to harm the environment. Uh, other things that are out there, too, is, is there's a lot of, a lot of uh, trust in diesel in, re in removing non-target species. But one of the things that we, that we do have is libraries and libraries full of video that show that any animal, no matter the species, if they're under a stress condition like drought or something of that nature, where there's not much food availability there, 
they're still going to eat those deer will still eat that 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 corn that's that's got diesel on it so there's a ton of other better options out there so leave the diesel in the gas can leave the diesel in the truck leave the diesel in the tractor but definitely don't leave the diesel on the ground okay so the next thing we need to think about there we already talked about it previously a couple of bullets up is is bug off we need to think about the oil rags or posts or anything like that and we'll cover this a little bit more as we start going through species in the next couple of slides so this is the typical dude right here that we see with the most concerns or questions coming in about is man those deer just will not leave me alone all right this also is obviously a game animal so whenever you're catching pigs in in june and july that doesn't mean you have the legal ability to send lead down range and remove some of your problems that you have so Think about changing your behavior and what you do in trapping those pigs to avoid the behavior of those, those deer. Yeah, they, those deer are active and can be active at any time of the day or night or anything like that, but those deer are predominantly diurnal where they're moving a little bit stronger at daylight, a little bit stronger at dark. So thinking about those deer behaviors and things like that, uh, changing your conditioning times, that's what you need to think about. And we talked about this earlier, conditioning best practices. Condition closer to the time you know that pigs are visiting your trap. So if you go back and look at your camera data that you have and you see that those pigs are not stirring until an hour after dark, well, you probably don't need to condition that trap until 30 minutes to an hour before dark. That way you shorten that window that deer even have access to that trap before they, um, they, the, the pigs actually get there. So the shorter the window, pigs and deer, they do not jihaw. Deer do not like, like pigs. All right. Whenever deer are at a trap site and a pig rolls in, deer's going the other way. If pigs are already at the trap site, deer's not coming to the party. All right. So we shorten that window. We make sure that those deer realize they're not invited. And that's just simple as, as human behavior. Some of the research things that we do see now, the findings that we do have out there now, is deer do not like purified egg solids there or putrefied egg solids, emulsified egg solids, things of that nature. And what we mean by that, you can get it under several different egg, uh, shelf names out there, but basically rotten eggs. They don't care for it. So if you've got a high density of deer, uh, what we're looking at is, is research projects that, that uh, will give us the, uh, the, the best chance of repelling deer with using that emulsified or putrefied egg solids. And basically what we're seeing a lot of positive results on there is that deer do not like that sprayed over the top of their corn at about twice the strength listed on the bottle with just nothing but water as a carrier and a pump up sprayer. Okay, so stay tuned with us because this is something that's ongoing. Uh, even though this is something that we see pretty promising results on, it doesn't mean, again, too, like we discussed earlier in the presentation, this may not be for every region that we find pigs. So we are still continuing to put this out in the field to make sure that whenever you have a recommendation from Pig Brig, that it is the best information at that time for your region. But even though we may know that it's the best thing at that time for your region, it doesn't mean it's a one and done and we put that recommendation on the, on the shelf and say it's good from now on. We're going to continue to uh, evaluate those, those repellents. Other things that are out there that are showing positive response for, for keeping deer pushed back is fermented rice bran. And we need to, we may have needed to put in there the fermented word, the word there, and bullet and in and, and all caps and underlined with balloons attached to the word fermented. Okay. Because if you look at, at, at how deer interact with regular, regular rice bran, come on, folks. I mean, you know, that's just like a crack to, to, to a deer. They're going to come from eight, miles and miles around to get to just standard rice bran. But you let that rice bran ferment for a little while. Man, that, that's like pizza that you already got penicillin growing on. So they just, they stay away from it. So make sure if you're using rice bran and ferment it in there with your corn that it is fermented. One of those things you think you need to ask about or look about there too, is how do you know if my bait's fermented or not? And this is something if you're just fermented standard corn, the, the, the takeaway in there is the length of time may depend on your region, okay? Obviously the more heat, the quicker it ferments. But whenever we think about this, is if the fermentation process is going on or ongoing rather, you crack the lid of that bucket open, and hold your nose real tight, but check to see if there's any bubbles coming off of that grain. If there's bubbles coming off that grain, it is still fermented and it is ripe and ready to go. If it gets to the point where there's no bubbles coming off of that grain inside that fermentation device, whatever you're using, we have passed the point of fermentation to the point of rot. 
And whenever you start dropping rotted bait on the ground, even the pigs are going to shy from that. So make sure that if it's fermented, it's truly, truly fermented. The other thing that what we have in the field right now, and this is something that's, that's pretty impressive, what we've seen so far, is using capsaicin as a, as a repellent. And when we think about capsaicin, man, that's the stuff that lights you on fire whenever we think about eating peppers and things like that. So this is something that is showing some pretty promising results in the field. Uh, we're narrowing the scope of where we think that the capsaicin is going to be most effective. That's another one you need to think about tuning into and staying att attached to us and moving forward with that, that research coming out, of the, coming out of the field, hopefully in the coming weeks. Uh, the next thing there says to dig a hole, and I am not talking about, please stress this, and Brooke, if you're listening, we need to amplify the, the, the voice on this here. Whenever I say dig a hole, that does not mean dig a hole to throw the deer in that won't leave your trap alone, all right? Whatever I mean by digging a hole there is whenever you dig a hole and you put your bait in a hole, if you put your bait in a hole, cover it with a couple of inches of soil, a deer is not going to stand there and paw at that ground to try to dig the bait up. All right. But if you start baking that, putting a, your bait in a hole, put a little bit of dirt over the top of that hole, it, you come back the next morning, it's going to look like somebody threw a, a grenade in that hole because those pigs will dig it up until they get every single kernel out of it. This will hold true to the coons that we'll discuss about in a little bit. The other thing there it talks about there is put up a pole. And I haven't seen a, a pig pole dance yet, but I've seen them do some pretty pretty neat stuff around a pole. And what I mean by putting up a pole is we talked a little bit earlier about pigs liking creosote, using it for an external uh, insect repellent. Well, if we're thinking about putting up a pole, that's what I'm talking about. We put the pole in there and it may have a super heavy creosote layer on it. That's excellent. If it doesn't, if it's your standard old corner post off your fence, then you can wrap a rug around that corner post and cover it with fish grease or fry grease. That works great. Now, whenever I said put up a pole, really what I'm thinking about here is I'm just going to put a pole in the trap. I'm not going to stand that pole up. I'm not going to dig a hole, put it in the ground. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put an eye screw in the end of each end of that pole, and I'm going to anchor that pole to the ground so it doesn't roll. We want to make sure that that pole stays exactly where you want it to, and then cover it with whatever fish or fry grease or something that you want to put on that pole. And then what you'll see is if the pole is standing up, you'll only have one pig at the pole at a time. But if you lay that eight foot long fence post down and you've got grease across that fence post, you may have a couple of different pigs on each side of that post at any given time. They're just looking for the relief from those non-parasite or those, 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 those external parasites. So I see this a lot where I'm at. I'm on the Texas Gulf Coast. we got a lot of rice. we got a lot of cropland, which means we have a lot of food. If you got a lot of cropland, then that means you also have a lot of water. Okay, if we have a lot of water, we have a lot of bugs. So we might not be able to catch pigs using food, but we can definitely catch pigs using that, that, that opportunity for them to remove those external parasites, all right? We've hit that, that drum all night long so far about the time of day. Shorten the time of the day or the, shorten the time frame that deer have access to that trap when you think pigs are gonna be there. Human behavior is the most important activity in avoiding non-target species. Now, the issue with where's the bait? OK, this is something that we need to really listen to really quickly. Think about whenever you see a deer out in the field and how they feed their head, their, their head is going in a sweeping motion from right to left, right to left, right to left. If you have the skirt of that pig rig trap system laying on the ground and you're waiting for those pigs to enter that trap system, then think about where your bait is laid. We suggest there strongly, strongly suggest that none of your bait is within 18 inches of the side of the skirt. That way those animals moving through there will, will commit to coming into that trap before they ever even encounter that, that bait. What we want to avoid is any bait that's laying within the, 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 the perimeter of that skirt itself. And what I mean by that is if that skirt's laying on the ground, we don't want bait to be in the mesh of that skirt while it's laying on the ground. The reason for that is as deer are going into that trap or trying to or attempting to go into that trap, their heads are going to be sweeping right to left trying to pick that corn up. And then especially the fall of the year, whenever you got those bucks with antlers in there, we don't want to take a chance on having a buck getting entangled in that net just because that sweeping feeding motion with that corn or that bait that may have been in that the, the skirting of that net. So think about where the bait is placed with regard to the feeding behavior of that deer. So don't, don't give those animals a chance to actively start feeding until they've committed to the inside of that trap system. And that accounts for all species.
All right, here we go. The old mask bandit in here, the coons, coons, coons. So they can get into everything. We know where they're at. We know they're in your in your Fido and your Fifi's water and, bo and food out on your front porch. They're all over the place. And they definitely like to hang out around pig rigs. So what we think about with pigs or with raccoons is kind of the same thing. Think about how many you have. All right, if you got two or three raccoons out there, we don't really worry too much about that because they're not gonna eat enough by the individual to do you very much damage if you're baiting adequately, All right? So if you're gonna be chinchy on the bait and you're only gonna put a handful of bait or so out there to catch a pig, hey, raccoons are probably gonna come in there and clean you out before the pigs get there, All right? So the other thing that we need to think about with regard to raccoons though, as we said it earlier, they are a fur bear. So you need to check your game loss to make sure that you know what your opportunities are, your options are and how you manage those, those raccoons. Same thing with the deer as it is with the raccoons. We want to dig a hole. Yeah, I know a raccoon will dig into the ground trying to dig up bait or dig up food because they do it on crawfish mounds. They do it in all different other places, things of that nature. But again, too, if you're putting adequate bait in there, dig a hole, cover it with a little bit of dirt, they're nowhere near going to get all of that bait. There's still going to be plenty left by the time those pigs show up. The put up the pole. Same concept with a deer. We're not going to see those those raccoons out there doing a lot of rubbing on, on oil rags or creosote posts or anything like that because they put oil or creosote in, in, in on their body. Man, you talking about a bad hair day, all right? Whenever you put in any of that petroleum type product in those, in those raccoons, it's going to stick around in that hair for quite a while. Uh, raccoons are pretty much the same way that we're seeing on, on, our, on our research trials in the field. Raccoons do not like uh, cats. Capsaicin. So if you want to keep the raccoons out of your crawfish bowl, slap a little capsaicin in there and you'll be able to, to keep the raccoons out of your out of your crawfish bowl. But fermented rice bran, they don't care for that as well. So we're, we're going to continue again, just like anything else. We're going to look at the other bait options and how we use those baits and, and certain things like that. Other things that I say, bring a fox to the party. We need to think about what are the predators of raccoons on the landscape that may be a predator of a, ra of a raccoon, but not a predator of a pig, okay? Whenever we think about pigs and coyotes, yeah, once a pig gets up weaning age or whatever the case may be, 20, 30, 40 pounds, coyotes aren't gonna be a predator enough to give them too much of a mind. But if your camera shows you that you've got a, a sounder of a few females and a bunch of little pigs, and you go out there and uh, say, bring a fox to the party. If you bring a coyote to the party, what that means is you take coyote urine and you put it in a trap, you're going to get rid of your pigs as well. Because those sows, even though they're not repelled by a coyote, they're going to make sure that they're, they're, those little piglets are nowhere around where there could be a coyote. But on the other hand, a fox is not going to be a predator of something out there that those pigs are going to give any mind to. So you may want to think about if you've got a, just a ton of raccoons that never leave your trap alone, it may be something that you want to think about looking to see how those, pit, those, those raccoons interact with a sponge or a cloth or something like that, or a cotton ball that has fox urine on it that may be hanging out of a tree in the area. If they think they can smell a predator in the area, they don't hang around the party very, very long. OK, so think about those natural behaviors and those natural avoidances those certain species have and then use that against them and you'll see a lot of response. Now, whenever we come to little Yogi and Boo Boo here, that's presenting itself as to be a, a situation that worth worth warranting or worth noting. And we talked about this early, earlier. If you know that you can condition those pigs adequately within five to seven days, so forth and so on, don't continue to condition longer than what you need because you're going to obviously give that bear the opportunity to find that, that pig rig. And then once those bears find that site, then, then pigs are gone, okay? If you have a bear walk through an area that pigs occupy, there's no harm, no foul. But whenever a bear typically finds a bait pile and they find easy food, they're going to lay down on that bait pile. They're going to go, uh, they're going to urinate. They're going to defecate in that immediate area. They're going to spread their smell everywhere. And that shows those pigs or tells those pigs, we got a bear that done set up a home right here and we are not coming to knock on the door. All right. So whenever you think about that is, is think about the process, how long you've got to work with, and then think about what do we do to minimize the available time that that bear has before we really start working on, on removing those pigs. So other things in there too, like we had said earlier, we are seeing some, uh, some, I guess, less, less uptake at feed sites or at, at pig brig trap sites. If you're using fermented rice bran and stress the point on the fermented again. Uh, capsaicin, we are seeing pigs that are, or bears rather, responding positively 
to leaving trap sites if we have capsaicin on the bait itself. Uh, they definitely don't like the hot stuff. All right. Once it gets to that certain point and we're seeing some very positive results as well, that that the, that the pigs will continue to feed at those same sites uh, that the bears are repelled from. But we've got to find the threshold. And that's what we need you to stay in touch with us there is as we start nailing down that threshold of what's available uh, to the pigs that they still continue to feed where it also does what we want it to do as a repellent for the bears. Same thing with the coons, the deer, and the bears is if you have issues out there with, with, with bait, specific bait choices, again, too, we can put the poles out there that's got those, those uh, I guess, uh, different types of baiting options, whether it's your oil or your, your petroleums, uh, like your creosote posts and things like that. Yeah, bears like to scratch and they like to rub and they like to, to, to do all things that bears do. But one of the things, just like those raccoons and those deer, they don't want that oily stuff matting up their hair. Uh, and they want they want to be able to, to, to walk through the woods looking good good with a good hair day. So whenever we start thinking about those pel those poles and those petroleums, uh, that's something to think about that bears are not really interested in. So other things that we're going to start narrowing down here is the, is the cows. I mean, so yeah, we got we got every cow out there in the pasture named and all those son of guns, they act sometimes like like teenagers can in their knuckleheads and they don't want to listen to us and all. But one of the things we need to think about with regard to cattle, if you're having problems with adult cattle, at the trap site, we need to check the body condition of those animals. If you can see every rib on that cow and that son of gun's coming to your trap site, it's because he's starving to death. And no matter what you do, they're probably gonna continue to come. So we need to think about the body condition scores of those. The other things that are out there that it doesn't matter if they're just fat and happy and just as beautiful as you can ever think a calf can look at, young cattle, yearling cattle, those five to 700 pound cattle are absolute knuckleheads. They're gonna to try to get into everything they can get into. They don't need any more feed, but it's just a curiosity deal that the bait you're using smells different and they wanna find out why, okay? So whenever we have cat those yearling cattle, those juvenile cattle in the area, you can have some issues with that. We'll also talk a little bit about here now about trapping behind that rotation. A lot of folks out there practice a rotational grazing system. And when we think about that rotational grazing system, we want to trap behind that rotational grazing system with regard to cattle. If we're in front of that rotational grazing system, you're going to have a lot of grass, okay? Because that's where you're about to rotate your cattle to. If you got a lot of grass there, then you you got to think about what contact your net, your pig rig is going to have with re regard to contact with the ground. We're going to have a lot more biomass and grass there that's going to try to hold that net up. So if you're trapping behind the rotation of cattle, the cattle has already been through there. They've grazed that grass down lower. You get a heck of a lot better contact with your net to the ground. The other thing out there, especially as we're going into the wintertime right now, how many of you out there right now or you know people that go out there and they supplement feed their cattle throughout the, the wintertime? If they're supplement feeding those cattle throughout the wintertime, especially if that supplement's got any form of corn in it or not, that undigested corn going out in the feces on those land, on those pastures, where do you think the pigs are going to be? They're going to be either in the rotation itself or they're going to be behind the rotation and they'll be picking out that undigested corn out of that feces. So they're going to be where the cattle either are or they have been. So if you wait till you trap behind the rotation, we completely avoid the problem with cattle in, 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 in immediately. So the other thing there is electric fence. If you have no choice, you have no opportunity to rotate those cattle. We have done some research projects and have outstanding results on the research projects, putting a single strand electric fence around your pig rig trap system. And what we did is in there is use a half inch electro braid tape at no, no less than 36 inches. We don't want to go below 36 inches of, of height on, on that, that electric fence or your big pigs will be able to reach that electric fence. And then man, electricity is going to change the whole mind of a pig and they're going to change zip codes on them. All right. So we want to keep that pit, that electric fence at least 36 inches above ground, but we really don't want to go much above 40 inches above ground or those juvenile cattle are just going to duck under that fence and go on through. But by using that half inch electro braid tape on that electric fence, now we have a visual cue as well as a negative reinforcement from the electricity. Because as those pig or those cattle see that 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 wider tape there, just instinctively they're going to sniff or explore that that electric fence with their tongue or with their nose or something, and then they're going to get a, a pretty good surprise that'll let them know that they're not welcome in a pig rig. 
So the single strand fence is pretty awesome. What I do want to make sure to draw your attention to, if you want to see it in detail, video of it, the written instructions of what to do on this electric fence, go to pigbrig slash support and you'll be able to download or view those videos and look at those support uh, videos that's there to show you more specifically about the details of what you do to install those electric fences the components you're gonna need, things that you're gonna to have to make sure of, like the power of the, the fence charger or what the current is moving through that fence. So check out those videos and then there's a library full of other videos there that'll help you as well. Other things there is using alternative baits. Alternative baits could be the same thing as the poles that we were talking about earlier. Other things that are out there, I've used uh, distiller's grain. Okay, you distiller's grain, it's already been through the distilling process. Cattle do not prefer distiller's grain, but pigs seem to use it pretty readily. That may be something that's, uh, that, that's more available regionally as in, rather than just being available at the end of your hands. So think about what those animals are there for. Are they If they're healthy, grown cattle, typically we don't ever see a problem with that. Uh, it's just those younger knuckleheads that get in the way. So with that, we're gonna go into some final thoughts. The main thing here, the difference between agriculture and wildlife with regard to management, Okay, whenever we're talking agriculture management, you hear the word integrated management throughout agriculture. The reason why we hear integrated management throughout agriculture is because we can put a lot of those management things on a calendar and follow a calendar throughout the management process or throughout the year. Whenever we think about wildlife, we do not ever have the opportunity to tell a wildlife species what they are or they are not going to do. So whenever we think about wildlife management, that is all about adaptive management. What are the conditions giving you that you have to work with? What are the animals telling you they're going to respond to? You have to be able to read the environment, read the animals, and adapt your management strategies accordingly. And then again, too, we're going to beat this drum one more time. You have to be patient. Be patient in everything you do, and then the animals will respond accordingly and, and moving forward, and you'll have good experiences. And then remember that, like we said in, in, the, in the introductory slides there, not everything works everywhere. OK, so you get excellent recommendations from a lot of friends around and whatnot. But if you get to the point where you realize it's not working for you, it's not that they give you bad advice. It may be that it just isn't going to work for your area. So that's one of those things that you can take a lot of advice, try it out. And it some things work, some things may not. But at least if you're out there trying and you'll figure figure out what works best for you, because Marshall and I can share a fence line and those pigs may operate completely different on his side of the fence as they do for me. Same area, same activity, same things like that. And they just re respond differently. And who knows why? All right. So figure things out there and we can help you through the process. Then the next thing is we're going to ask, where is the stress coming from? All right. Those animals, all animals, domestic or wild animals, they're going to respond to stress. The first time we think about stress is it may be drought stress. Whenever we have drought stress, that could be the fact of obviously the lack of water in a given area. But what with, with drought comes the decreased availability of good food. Whenever we have that stress, animals are going to perform atypical. I mean, absolutely not do what they're normal and what their normal behaviors would do. So be aware of where the stress is coming from and adapt accordingly. The other thing that a lot of times we overlook is where the stress is coming from. We may just simply need to look in the mirror. Our activities may be putting undue stress on those animals because of what we're doing. So we need to think about if it's not an environmental stress, could it be in a stress that, that we as humans are imposing on those animals? Because if it's, a, if it's a positive experience that they have on the landscape, they see you on on a tractor, they see you on a four-wheeler all the time, and it's no harm to them, there's no stress. But whenever they, every time they see a side-by-side, -side, they have somebody shooting a gun at them, then you're going to have a stress and you're not going to get the responses that you want. So think about the origins of that stress. Where is that stress coming from? And, and adapt accordingly as you go through. So that's going to wrap up the actual content part of what we're going to discuss tonight. The other that we want to do is make sure that you're aware of these are the, the, the events that are coming up in the next few months. Again, to the November class, the November webinar will be on November the 17th. Same bat time, same bat place, same bat channel. 
All right, seven o'clock central time, eight o'clock eastern time, and then oh, I don't know, Brooke. I think that's going to be what five o'clock west uh, Pacific time. So that's going to be a different few different times. We do record all of these webinars, so if you didn't hear the, if you don't hear one that you want to hear, then come back and download it, listen to it later. Direct your your friends and family to them if you think they can learn something. Uh, so that one's November the seventeenth. The one in December is going to be on December the eighth. OK, December the 8th at, at those appropriate times, uh, again, will be recorded. So uh, what we're going to do at this point, we're going to pass this on and then uh, open it up. Uh, I think that the, the team has been uh, uh, watching the chat. And at this point, if any of you have any questions, put those questions in the chat. And I think, Marshall, if you would go through there and kind of see if there's anything that we need to uh, explain better. And also, folks, at this time here, what we do when we get to the end of these, these, these uh, uh, discussions like this, Marshall, Ryan, and myself are in three completely different parts of the United States and maybe different perspectives on what we have. So whenever we open this up to the chat, to the discussion, it may not hurt to throw in there what part of the country you're at because we need to, to make sure that we give you the best information we have. You got anything, Marshall? I think I'll jump in real quick here, and uh, I will sure. mention one thing on the raccoons. Um, you didn't quite touch on this, but we've had uh, Randy had posted on it, and we had a person on the Facebook owners group that posted, and that's basically to make an escape route for your raccoons. So it's Very to take thing. a small stick or something, lay it on from basically the center of the trap up over the, the edge wall of the trap. Uh, so they can get out easy. The other thing to do is to cut a short piece of two by four um, and a small piece of chain and hang it off the trap cap and just let it dangle so it doesn't doesn't actually hit the ground, might be a couple inches off the ground so that they can crawl up that and get out. Um, you know, we've had a few few instances where people show up and the, the coons are tucked up underneath the trap cap there. They can't quite navigate over the edge of it some slow coons, I guess, but um, that, that really helps if, if you just, and it doesn't take much of a stick. It's just, just something to lay on there um, so that they can crawl up and get over the, the trap cap. So that's helpful. In addition, I'd, I'd posted um, the um, blog post you did on the um, using electric fence for the deer. It's on the chat. Uh, there's a link to that. And there's also a link to the application of the liquid fence, the putrefied egg solids for uh, deterring deer. So th those are in the um, chat function. You can copy those and just stick them somewhere on your browser so that uh, you have those as reference. But they're all linkable through the, the PigBrig support page, which is pigbrig.com backslash support. Yeah, we just got a uh, question about the what concentration and application rate should be used for liquid fence on corn yeah what we do on the on the corn what we found obviously that we get different levels of, of repellent ability uh at any level but what we look at there to get the best response on the deer and keeping those pushed back is twice the limit of what's listed on the bottle okay so whenever you get your your ingredients your your directions for use what it says directions for use, you want to double that. And uh, and typically what we do is we put that in a one gallon pump up sprayer with just one gallon of water and add that double strength uh, liquid fence to that. And, and that, then whenever we put that over the top of the corn, bottle, not the premix. Yes, yes, definitely good point, Marshall. Very good point. You want the concentrated, not the premix. And, and whenever we put that over the top of that corn, we don't want to just mist it to where it's just a little bit of a dusting there. We want to go ahead and saturate that pretty good. And I mean, we don't want that there to be a puddle of water setting under the corn, but what we want to do is make sure that that, 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 that uh, emulsified egg solid solution be, is able to navigate its way down through that corn pile that you got there. Currently, the recommendation on the concentrated liquid fence is 10 to one. So it's, it ends up being like 11.8 um, ounces of the concentrated liquid fence to one gallon of water is what they recommend. So our concentration is double that. So if you take the amount of water in ounces and divide that by five, that'll give you your concentration. So that's how many ounces of liquid fence you would add. So basically 11.8 ounces of liquid fence to half gallon of water is the easy way to do it. Uh, another question is, can regular eggs be used in conjunction with bait? 
We have had some folks that have used regular eggs in there, and, and what they do is it, it you remove the opportunity of being able to put in, put in a pump-up sprayer, obviously. But what they can do is they can take that the, the eggs, just your regular yard eggs or your store-bought eggs, and if you're going to be fermenting your corn, then uh, then you can put those eggs inside that fermentation process and uh, and be able to, to get that effect. What you're going to have to do, though, is you're going to have to, to use four or five eggs to a five-gallon bucket of water. So we want to make sure that we got plenty plenty of that emulsified egg there to be able to uh, to find its way into the grain of that corn as, uh, as well. And then also too, whenever we bait that trap, yeah, definitely you're going to pour the shell out. You're going to pour the, the the concentration out and all. But just remember that technique of what we, we said about as far as baiting those baiting the, those traps. Don't let any of that bait get into your skirt. The other thing too, what we need to make sure that we draw attention to, Marshall, is, is that whenever you're baiting those traps and sometimes that nasty slurry that you may be baiting those traps with, don't throw that through the net, okay? Whenever you're baiting those traps, don't stand on the outside and just throw that slurry through the net because what that's going to do is it's going to completely cover your net with that bait smell. Then you're going to have everything walking around that trap, deer, coons, pigs, whatever the case may be. If they even are curious about it, then you'll have them, them animals uh, uh, just camping out at that part of your trap. So they may not ever even go in. Chewing on it. Yeah, right. So if you're going to bait with those fermented baits and things like that, then then make sure that you get those fermented baits exactly where they're supposed to be rather than just throwing it through the mesh of the trap. And it's important to remember that the eggs need to be putrefied, right? We're looking at right, very egg much. knowledge, just not emulsified. They've got to be putrefied as well. So they're yeah. they're going to be stinky. You'll know you'll know when you hit the right spot cuz <laughs> you'll hardly be able to stand them. That's it. And then obviously always keep for watching the, the, the water bubbling in that fermentation process. If it's, if it's fermenting, it's still cooking. Like the old moonshiners say, if it's thumping, it's it's working. There you go. Anybody else have a question? Man, I don't know if that's good or bad, Marshall. Not too many questions, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, obviously, as you go through the day and you go through the trapping and moving forward through the fall of the year, or any time of the year, uh, definitely give us a call. Always, always, always at Pig Brig. Whenever you call us, you're going to talk to us. So whenever you call that number, you'll get in touch with Margaret or her team and customer support, or you're going to be talking to Ryan Marshall, myself. You may be talking to Randy. So you're going to be talking to the people that are in the field, that are doing the work, that are in there with you, uh, making things happen. So um, don't don't feel like that that whenever you call, you're going to get a, a cue that's going to send you somewhere else that just um, that, that don't really worry about your success because we definitely want to make sure you're successful. I will say uh, that uh, Richard Dobson had had requested information on squirrels and crows, and we didn't touch on those on the, the um, webinar here. So maybe we want to address that. Yeah, the squirrels, quickly. and we'll go ahead and hit really quickly on the squirrels. Uh, squirrels, is, that's a good point. You need to think about this, and this is one of those things that Marshall and I and Ryan, we worked on one of these questions here just recently, is in the, in the, in the, the fall of the year, squirrels are going to really start freshening those nests up. So whenever we start seeing those squirrels start trying to freshen those nests, Stuff, they're going to be grabbing everything from feathers to leaves to whatever debris they can find. If you got a passel of squirrels that are doing trapeze stunts on your pig brig, then be cognizant that you may end up having those rodents start chewing on your nets. Okay, so one of the things that you do with the regard to the squirrels is the same thing that you would do if you have coons out there. Think about the predator, the uh, predators of squirrels. So it may very well be that you grab that fox ear and put that on a on a on a sponge or a cotton ball or something of that nature and, and get it in the area of that uh, of that pig brig. Whenever those pre those those squirrels and other prey species can smell that predator in the area, they are not hanging around. Uh, the other thing with regard to the crows, yeah, them son of a gun start coming through and 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 I don't know. I mean, it, it, I kind of guess it defines itself whenever you call a whole bunch of crows either a murder or an unkindness. They don't do good things when they come in an area. So what we think about on, on crows, though, is that they're not active at night. So if you know your pigs are not coming in until eight or nine o'clock at night, don't bait during the daytime whenever crows have access to those baits all day long every day. So what we want to do is make sure, again, with regard to crows, bait later in the day, 
and make sure that whenever you bait later in the day that you follow those protocols about keeping the engine running, things of that nature, because crows are one of the ones that typically find their way to a roost pretty early. So uh, if you bait within a, bait those traps within an hour of dark, typically those crows have already got to the point where they're not real active. Uh, they definitely don't like landing on the ground late in the evening, early in the morning, wherever there's a shadow. If there's a shadow, there could be a predator in the shadow and they, you won't find them near, near often uh, uh, landing in areas with shadows. So late in the day, baiting late in the day, just like you would with many of the other non-target species will take care of that crow issue. Um, apply to fabric or no egg solution? One of the things that I think you could do with regard to fabric, and this is something that we've gotten to the point that we're, we're finding is a lot easier to work with, because obviously it's a lot easier to work with a, uh, a dry grain than it is to work with a fermented grain, because inevitably you working with a fermented grain, you're going to get that garbage all over it. You're going to stink like rotten corn all day long. But what we think about, though, is that if you're using the emulsified egg solid to be able to repel deer, if it's not on the bait, it's probably not going to repel them. Now, if you find that that emulsified or, or putrefied egg solids are, are, are very sought after by your pigs, you may be able to bait your traps with a regular dry corn, put your, your emulsified egg solid on a fabric or a rag of some kind and elevate it above the ground and let the wind carry the smell in any direction to attract those pigs to your trap site. But if that emulsified egg solid is not on the bait itself, it's not gonna do the job. I think the other point in there, is that you don't want to get that on your trap. Your trap's going to stink to high heavens and you don't want to get it on yourself either. I, I made the mistake when I did the video, I bled the pressure off the sprayer and doused myself good with it. No, it was terrible. I didn't have to yes. go away close, but I came really close. Right, right. And that's the, that's the thing that I do whenever I'm baiting traps. I try to use ways that I'm not going to end up wearing that stuff because typically I'm in the field early and often. And it's inevitable on the first trap, I'm going to get that garbage on me and I may have to go to no telling where bait and traps and I'm going to smell like it the rest of the day. I think there was somebody in here who uh, was asking about a diagram of the pole and I'm assuming that um, they were talking about your oil rag pole. That's not you something bet. we do here. So if you've got a if you've got a something on that, we'll have to make sure that we get that posted up somewhere so people have access to it. Yeah, that'd be super easy. We can get that thing cranked out real quick, get something wrapped, uh, take pictures of it, post it on the Pig Brig owner's uh, Facebook page. Uh, we can put it on our Pig Brig site where anybody around the world can come on there and see what's going on. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for that. That'll be out really quickly. Any other question? I think that one goes out to Joe Litchard. He's, he's the one that um, had posted that. So we'll have to make sure we get that to him. Sure, you bet. Anybody else? No takers? Folks, we didn't take but four extra minutes off of your life. We were four minutes after, after eight o'clock in, in, in Texas. So uh, we wanna try to make sure that we limit these somewhere to an hour, but as long as the questions are come in, coming in, we're gonna stay up as long as you wanna stay here. So if y'all got any questions, definitely keep them coming, but uh, we don't wanna take more time away than what you're willing to give. Marshall, I think I've seen a couple of other chats that are hitting the box. I don't know if that's the other questions that we're having or not. Yeah, they're just saying thank you. Uh, cool deal. Oh. Yeah, y'all pass the word, folks, because this is something, again, we do every month, and we try to hope this helps you. So give us feedback, good, bad, or indifferent, whether or not this is helpful and what we can do to make it more helpful for you. Uh, pass the word. These, these uh, webinars are recorded. So if you want to take this and play it at the Lions Club or you want to play it at the FFA meeting or you want to you want to take it to wherever else, definitely uh, pull the pig brig side up, put those webinars out wherever you think that they can help the public. Other than that, Marshall, I think that um, that, yeah, we just we look forward to what what uh, folks have gotten recommendations to follow up that last meeting in April that we have scheduled with the with the topics moving forward. All right. Sounds good, guys? Yes, sir. All right, folks, we do appreciate y'all joining us tonight and, and definitely come back with us on, on, on uh, uh, November the 17th. And if we talk nice, Marshall, maybe even bring Thanksgiving dinner for us a little early. But uh, 
with that, we'll go ahead and log off. Y'all be safe. Keep trapping. Let us know what's going on. Post the pictures and, and, uh, and involve your friends. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank y'all. Y'all be safe.